welcome to tonight's episode of the Dead Astrology Society. This is episode number eight, and we're talking about Evangeline Adams tonight. So, here we are on paramaniradio.com, and I'm so grateful for the chance to have to, uh, to talk to wonderful astrologers and people interested in astrology tonight. I'm your host, Donna Woodwell. I'm an astrologer, hypnotist, magician, take your pick. You can find me at 4moonsastrology.com in Austin, Texas. And as our tagline says, the Dead Astrologer Society is where history meets mystery. Every week we have a special group of, of guests talking about a topic from the various cultural landscape of astrology and all of the history of astrology. So this is astrology beyond the pages of magazine horoscopes. So don't ask what it all means for your sign. Our guests are eclectic, but we all love the stars, and we love exploring the myriad ways that humans have yearned for the sky. And we love exploring it with you. So if you have any questions, don't be shy. Just post them in the paramaniradio.com chat room, and we will take a look and try to work them into our show. In tonight's episode, as I said, we're talking about Evangeline Adams. Evangeline Adams was an astrologer from the United States at the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century who made massive changes in the way astrology was practiced and, and known by the masses. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our special guests and the other people on our call tonight. We have um, the woman who literally wrote the book on Evangeline Adams. We have Karen Cristino. She wrote two books on Evangeline Adams. She is an astrological consultant and a columnist who lives in New York City. We also have joining us, helping us ask questions because everyone wanted to be on talking to Karen tonight. Um, we have Enid Newberg, who is the president of Kepler College, and we have Susan Hansen, who is a tarot author and a member of the Traveling Psychic Supper Club. She's learning about radio tonight, so she's here <laughs> in my office physically, and we're having fun. So everyone, welcome. Welcome tonight. Thank and you. Karen, Thank you. I'm going to ask you the first question. Who is Evangeline Adams? Okay, as you said very succinctly, she was late 19th century, early 20th century astrologer. She was born in 1868. She died in 1932. She uh, grew up in Boston, and or she established herself in Boston, first of all, and then when that became too restrictive for her in terms of doing astrology 100 years ago more, uh, she moved to New York City in 1905. And she really popularized astrology. She's one of the first people to do so. Um, she wrote a number of books or had her name as the author of a number of books. Um, she marketed herself. Um, she married a gentleman that was almost 25 years younger than she was when she was in her 50s, which is, always surprises me from that period of time, but he was a marketer, and he publicized her, and he got a lot of magazine coverage for her. He got her on the radio, I think it was 1931, and so she really brought astrology to public consciousness, basically. I love hearing about her life story, and as I was telling everyone before we got on the air, I'm so excited that you are on with us tonight so I can pick your brain and hear the stories. <laughs> So how did she get invo how did Evangeline get involved in astrology in the first place? I mean I would think that she was an educated young woman of her time that's a weird thing to pick up. She she was she was when she was a young woman um she says in her autobiography that she became very ill. She doesn't say what she had um probably something like scarlet fever or one of those uh, diseases that kind of were common in those days and before antibiotics it took a long time to get better. So she was sick for a long time, and um, it was very popular uh, in the Boston area in those days to have homeopaths treat you. And actually, at that time, um, some of the people she, she got to know later on were professors at uh, homeopathic colleges. So she was treated by a homeopath who, as they are today, um, have more esoteric ideas than what they would call the regulars, the regular physicians, which 
kind of is what we're left with today after the American Medical Association <laughs> kind of shunted mm -hmm. them aside. So she was treated by a homeopath. He introduced her to a lot of ideas. Um, also, she studied when she was quite a bit younger, I think, you know, early teens, maybe even younger, Elizabeth Stewart Phelps, who was a very famous author at the time. And she was also interested in the occult, interested in the world beyond. So Evangeline, I think, naturally gravitated to it, but people came her way that introduced her to it. And then when she moved to Boston, her doctor introduced her to uh, Dr. J. Heber Smith, who um, taught at... Um, one of the Massachusetts colleges taught homeopathy, and he taught her astrology. He used astrology in his medical diagnosis. So in a way, she's coming from a much older tradition of astrology through homeopathy. And uh, the other big astrologer in the United States around that time, the late 19th century, was uh, Dr. Luke Broughton, who was another homeopath. And I suspect Dr. Smith studied with him but his work was an influence on Evangeline as well. Um, so uh, her background kind of, even though she was not a medical person per se, came out of these medical people. That's how she learned astrology. Wow, that must have given her a unique perspective on astrology, um, especially, I mean, this was before the era of psychological astrology, um, which yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about when we get a little further in the conversation tonight. So she was sick, and she learned astrology from her physicians. Mm -hmm. How did she make a transition from being a student to being one of the most well-known astrologers of her time? She gives the story that she had to go to work. That That's the suggestion um, in, in her autobiography, that uh, her, her dad had died when she was a little girl. And her brothers were all quite a bit older, and she was left with her mother. Uh, she was born when her mom was almost 40, so her mother was older. And they moved, the family moved to Boston, and uh, she had to support herself. So uh, she became very interested in astrology and studied it, and her very straight-laced Boston relatives objected to it. And um, she kind of had to make a choice. She had started doing readings for people, I think like a lot of us do, um, just for family and friends, and people are fascinated by it. And then someone comes along that offers you money. So she had started doing it that way. The family was very upset. They had given her a job with a family friend. She was engaged to her boss. And that all fell apart because the family disliked the astrology so much so then, ironically, she was kind of forced to go into it full-time professionally. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of a client base would she have had? She had a lot of different types of people. She, uh, You know, the names in her autobiography are not really familiar to us today, but uh, a lot of uh, women, but she says a lot of men as well, that women more came to her office. She said when she first started practicing, people would kind of, you know, put scarves over their heads and hats over their <laughs> you know, to kind of disguise themselves because it was, you know, not considered the thing to do, but they wanted the information. Um, but basically people from all walks of life. And eventually in Boston, she says she worked with some very prominent people, the head of a detective agency, um, people that were involved in mental health, um, the theatrical producers, actresses, actors very often came to her, which is very similar to when she came to New York. Um, I think she even said she read for a state senator. She had eventually developed a high clientele, and the Adams name, uh, she was related to the presidential Adams. I, you know, and I get the impression her family was kind of well-to-do, put her at a higher level to begin with. Mm -hmm. Could I tell you something funny about that? Um, in Boston, um, John Quincy Adams House is in is in Quincy, and it's a tourist spot. And right across the street 
is a read a tea room where they do astrological charts. Oh, how funny! Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she would have liked that. Like, I think. I think so one too. of the yeah. stories yeah. about Evangela, mm-hmm. this is one of the things that got me interested in her in the first place, is that it's often said she's descended from the presidents and. It's not the case. That was my what first got me kind of hooked into doing the research on Evangeline was that I went to the library and they have books in the genealogy department that show all the descendants of the presidents. And of course, she wasn't in it. So that got me started. And basically, in her promotional brochures, she said she was descended from the same family and she's, she is related to them. The, the first settlers of the Adams that came to Massachusetts in the 1600s, there were seven sons, and one of the sons, the presidents are descended from, and another of the sons, she's descended. So they're distant cousins, but they are related. Right. Yeah, I come from one of those New England families, too. I've seen the family tree. It's quite it's quite lateral. <laughs> Once you figure out first wife's kids, second wife's kids, multiple yes. siblings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and my my sister married someone a, a Brahmin who um Tewksbury, who's in the social register and they said if someone was misbehaving they wouldn't put that child's name in the social register it's just they would disappear so perhaps she really did descend from this family and could maybe they just didn't want her in the social register because she was practicing practicing astrology could that be <laughs> No, she is no. actually <laughs> the woman in the, in, the, in the historical society in Boston found the book for me where it's a, a genealogical history of the Adams. It's actually a whole book on them. And mm-hmm. she is in the book, but she's just descended from a different person. And all the research I've done actually recently, now that you can go online and do Ancestry.com and all these other sites, she mm-hmm. it, it supports it that um, she's just descended from a different line in the family. So the genealogy actually had her real birth date? Because I know she, throughout her life, gave, what, four or five different dates of birth or ages? Had, when I was doing the research, I found different dates on her. On her, she, They got married, she and her husband, in New York City, and I live in New York City. So that was one of the documents, their marriage license, that I got early on. And she, they both lied about their age on the marriage record because there were, I think there was, there was a 23 year age difference. So I think that would have been considered scandalous and I guess they didn't ask for your birth certificates in those days. So she lied on that. Uh, census records in the, her later years, um, show different dates of birth. Um, but those sometimes are not written by the person themselves. But in any event, her birth date, um, it was 1868 in um, the, the Adams genealogy book, the old one. I think it came out at the, you know, 1909 or something like that many years ago. And also since then, I found an 1870 census that places. I, I always felt it was an 1868 birth because she never offered publicly in an article, a different date. And um, it was just kind of, I think she's just a little sloppy, <laughs> basically. <laughs> wow. So how did she move from a practice in Boston down to New York City? She moved. She began, it was a slow process in her book. Her book is very dramatized. She really was. You know, I see her as a myth maker. She had a lot of Pisces and she had Neptune rising and she dramatized things and she tells very good stories. And in her book and a lot of the articles, the interviews she did when she was practicing, it's as if, boom, she moves to New York in 1899. But it's not like that at all, that um, she lived in Boston. She was listed in Boston City Directory until like 1904, and she doesn't officially appear in New York um, until 1905, I think, around that time. So she talks about when she first came to New York in 1899, um, actually Dr. Smith, who really was a mentor to her, I think he died in 1898, her mom died around the same time, and it was just, I think it was too restrictive there, the people that supported her were no longer there, and she wanted to go, <laughs> and she found a good time when she had a terrific Jupiter transit. 
and she came to New York in 1899 for the first time temporarily. Wait, was that when she moved into the, the hotel? She lived in the hotel, and uh, this was the famous story that you always hear about her, that she predicted the Windsor Hotel fire, which there are accounts about it, that, that there are many accounts about it. Uh, there were uh, like a dozen, or if not more, New York City daily newspapers at that time, if you can believe it. It's changed so radically today. But um, and uh, it was a huge disaster. A lot of them, most of the papers covered it. And um, in a number of them, she is, she appears. They, she was missing for a while. People didn't know where she was. She had moved to another hotel. Um, and she claims in her book that on the front page of the New York Times or some other prominent newspaper, it said, fire predicted. Um, I have not been able to find that. Now, there were a lot of papers, so maybe it happened. But what I found is her Evangeline saying that she predicted the fire. So she herself promoting herself as she was so good at doing. <laughs> Didn't you, in the book, did it say that she also read his palm and she saw um, yeah, it was she did not palmistry. a very... She studied palmistry in Boston. That was another thing that as the years went on, she didn't publicize that. I don't know that she did practice it eventually because when she was arrested for fortune telling, I think astrology showed, you know, it was a much stronger to prove a tradition and that it was legitimate. And um, I, I believe she used it less as the years went on, but she had been practicing both and in some of the early city directories in New York City, she's listed as both a palmist and an astrologist. And in one of them, she's just listed as a palmist, one of the first mm. years she was in New York. But yes, she did say that she thought there were danger signals in the hotel proprietor's palm. And then, of course, he died. He had such the poor guy. His wife got killed. I mean, the whole the, his this huge investment, this hotel he owned, was destroyed by this fire. Um, his wife was killed in the fire. One of his daughters was killed in the fire. A lot of uh, many people were killed in the fire, and he was very distraught. And um, I forget what, exactly what happened to him, but he died very shortly after the fire. He he was completely, you know, he was broken down emotionally and physically as well, and he died. So um, she says in her book that he told people that she predicted it, which could have happened, but I, I haven't been able to find that. Hmm. So, this isn't the only thing that she became famous for predicting. That's correct, right? Right. She claimed to have predicted a lot of things. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting marketing kind of strategy um, that I have actually found documentary evidence. This was another thing that really interested me because, you know, she talked to the papers quite a lot. Um, and I was able to find documentary evidence of her predictions that she had, I think in the 20s, um, pretty much predicted World War II. Now, um, it gets to the nature of astrological prediction. It is a cycle. Um, she said that um, in 1776, Uranus was in the sign of Gemini, which is the sign ruling the U.S., and then 84 years later, which is a cycle of Uranus, we had um, the Civil War. So she was marking the next return, 84 years, she projected it to 1943-44, I believe. So she had the timing consistent, and I found an, quite a number, actually, of these forecast for World War II that she did in the 20s, um, but she didn't know exactly what would happen. So she, in some of them, it's more accurate than in others. Uh, one of them, she says, there'll, there'll be another great war, you know, for racial and religious reasons, which you can see how that might apply. Um, in another one, she says there'll be another civil war or another war here in this country. Uh, but So she has the timing very accurate, but um, the details, of course, you know, that's the symbol that it's very hard for us to specify. Wow. Now, I've, I've also heard that 
that she predicted the crash, the economic crash of 1929? I don't know if she predicted it. Um, Oh, she did predict that. You're right. (laughs) You're right. I have to refresh my memory. And I believe that was another Uranus cycle, too. But this one was interesting because this was when she was very prominent, and it was in the late 20s, and she was saying, I think she said between 1928 and 29, there'll be another crash. And it was another cycle. I think it was a Jupiter-Uranus type of cycle. And... um, It wasn't happening in 1928. Everyone was making money. Everyone wanted to get into the market. And in 1929, it was the same thing. And and a few times, she reiterates it, and it doesn't happen. And then right at the end, in October of 1929, there is the crash. So that's another one that I was able to document that's pretty specific. I think she might have said, you know, 27 to 29 or something like that. It wasn't, you know, again, it was a cycle. So um, the timing was pretty correct. But it, she would have been wrong for 27 and 28. So I have people reading the book, like my husband, who's very skeptical, that say, well, she was wrong. But my goodness, to, to have any of it be accurate, to pick dates like that, that, well, even if it wasn't 100% correct, uh, it's uh, astonishing to me. It is. Yeah. And, uh, that you know, that's what astrology can do. And I think a lot of scientific types, they can't relate to this, the symbols. They want very specific specifics. And, of course, often the specifics are not going to be as accurate as the general impression, the general... Um, it, the timing, of course, is usually uh, the thing that astrology can do best, but we can also give an impression of the type of thing to expect. Mm-hmm. Well, well, you mentioned uh, when she got arrested. Didn't she get arrested like three times? Yes, as far as I know, she got arrested three times, the poor thing. She was never arrested in Boston. For well, You know, that supposedly was a more conservative city. In 1911, she was arrested in New York City, and she got off. The charges were dismissed. In in 1914, they tried the case, but then the judge found in her favor. And um, there still is a fortune-telling law on the books in New York City. No one does anything about it anymore. And then in 1923, again, she was arrested, and uh, they, they just let her off that time, I assume, because there was a precedent from her previous trial, but they had established that she was not trying to fraud people, that it was, you know, what she told. And all of these were sting operations that um, the city detectives decided to make a sweep, and they sent in these lady detectives to pose as... Uh, a person, a client, and they had their chart read, and then they arrested her after she took the money. So That's terrible. It, it was, yeah, and it wasn't that she had a complaint by her client. It was just, <laughs> yes. The detectives weren't complaining. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it was just detectives. And she did, it, she lived in Carnegie Hall later, you know, after she established herself in New York, and around the corner, down the block, I forget exactly on which street, but there was this whole block of fortune tellers of, you know, very different stripes and I'm sure different levels of legitimacy. So it was, they would go in to see a lot of different of these people. A lot of people were arrested at the same time. She was the one that got written up because she was the most well-to-do and had the most well-to-do clients. Mm-hmm. And so is the story the about the trial in 1914 where the, the judge supposedly says, you you know, she reads his chart and he says, no, nah, you're not a fortune teller. Is that story true? The, the trial is true, and there is a partial transcript. There's a New York City court report that, you know, you can go into a law library and pick up a book from 1914 and get this a partial transcript. It's not, this is, it's, with Evangeline, there's always a mystery. There's a level, I mean, I tried, you know, to see what was realistically true. And there's always a level of something that I couldn't prove or something that uh, you don't know. So, for example, very often when you have a trial transcript, it's a full transcript and you get what everyone said and everything that happened. In this case, it's a report, so it's a partial transcript. So we do, And it's got these ellipses where they put these little asterisks, so they, they're leaving something out. 
So um, it is true that she was tried. The judge appeared, when you read this transcript, to be on her side the whole time. And in the end, he lets her off, and he, he says that she raises astrology to the level of science. So that's literally a quote from the judge's order and decision. But uh, there's this story that she read his son's chart, um, Part of what came out in this 1914 trial was the detective had her look at her son's chart, and I think he, in, in the transcript it gives the dates, and I think he had a son conjunct Uranus in his chart or something like that, so Evangeline said he should be careful because he could die in, elect, in an electric accident and he should be careful around electricity. So this lady then, in, as part of her testimony, said that Evangeline said her son would die, so you know, that's that's the question. So uh, the story goes that then the judge said she should read his son's chart. And then there are all kinds of elaborations on the story that I've never found an original source for any of them. It might have happened. I think it did happen that she read a chart for the judge. I talked to some lawyers when I was doing this research who said that's it's not appropriate. He should have just judged her. Did she you know, break the law when she did this reading for the detective. It has nothing to do, really, with what she can do, but it does appear that she read some chart, but I have no idea who she read, what it was about. Um, there's a story that she, the judge's son died, and she had read his chart and said he would die this way. But, uh, again, I was able to go online and get these census records. It doesn't appear that the judge ever had a son that died. So, you know, it's it's always layers of... Um, you know, mystery to this that people like to elaborate on. Something happened. I don't know what it is. <laughs> the bottom line. <laughs> the bottom line, she was really good at her own promotion from the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and let's was. come back after the break and continue finding more about Evangeline Adams' self-promotion. So please, come back. And I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat for the rest of this one, and I'm sure you will be too. So we will see you in a few minutes. And welcome back to tonight's episode of the Dead Astrologer Society. I'm your host, Donna Woodwell, and I'm here with our fascinating guest, Karen Cristino, who is the biographer of Evangeline Adams. I'm also with Eden Newberg and Susan Hansen, and I'm so excited to be continuing our conversation on this fascinating woman. So, we were just starting to talk about how Evangeline Adams worked with the media, how she promoted herself. So let's talk about that. I turn over the floor to you, Karen. Okay. She really, um, from the time she first comes to New York, she's in the newspapers, not all the time, but um, she got herself in the papers in 1899. She, she got coverage for herself. And there are other times, too, particularly when she was arrested in 1911. She kind of turns it to her advantage that the stories are picked up, but I think she also then spoke to the reporters. She invited them in. She uh, she had a Leo moon. She, uh, you know, liked to talk about herself. She liked to talk about her successes. So she gave interviews in 1914, especially when she was arrested again and had the trial. There's a lot of coverage on her in 1923 as well. Um, I think she met her husband around 1920, and he really bumped up her profile. Uh, in the 20s, it was a time when media really was, it's interesting because very like today, media really was changing. And there were, um, you know, going back to the late 19th century, a lot of newspapers, but as you get into the teens and 20s particularly, there are a lot of magazines. So uh, they're looking for interesting coverage. And he got her in the magazines. Um, eventually she authored books. Um, he got coverage for them. They're always reviewed. I mean, it was very, very professionally done. And from what I've heard from um, the niece of the woman, one of the women who worked for Evangeline for many years, nobody, as well as um, her family from a totally different uh, source of the information, the people in the office and her family, nobody liked Evangeline's husband, that, 
you know, he, he, he was just not a nice guy for whatever reason. She comes off very well whenever you hear reports people really liked her, but nobody liked him except her. But he really publicized her. I don't think people would really remember her today if it weren't for him, because I don't think she would have written these books if it weren't for him. She was talking about writing books going back many, many years before they came out. I think her biography appeared in 1926. Um, And then he got her on the radio. And that was a big deal. And radio was kind of young, but by, I think it was 1930, 31 when she did that, it was for less than a year. Um, but it was a syndicated show. It went across the country. She appeared, I think, two or three times a week for half an hour. And they made a lot of money uh, from it. She had had a small office before that, and her husband had his own office on a different floor in the Carnegie Hall studios. But um, when right before her biography came out they tripled the office space and they had I think one account says dozens of secretaries doing reports sending these standardized reports out and people would write to her from the radio show that's how they learned about her wow were these standardized reports like you had with um, Alan Leo doing where somebody says what I'm born and they just put together the different pieces exactly it's the same thing i think he came up with it first and they're different you know sun and leo moon and libra mercury and virgo that type of thing you get a different page um there were there were a couple of them at the new york public library when i was researching this that i was able to copy and it it's a very early version of what you can get today you know, once computers came out, they this became very popular. I guess it was in the 80s. Um, so it, it's interesting, the cycles of this, too. But, yes, it was um, – I think she was inspired by Alan Leo, but she did it on a much larger scale. And then, of course, he died. Um, so it be, she, she, I don't know what else happened in the U.K., but she became very popular here. And a lot of people read her horoscopes. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, and they were very readable. I, I realize, I mean, I have one of her 1931 books, um, Astrology for Everyone. She's mm-hmm. very readable today. Yeah, I, I mean, it's is. fun to read this. It's not like you dusting off something that's, you know, a, this is getting close to 100 years ago, and it's still very fresh in a way. Yeah, and by the time she wrote them, she had been a much more predictive astrologer, which I think was very 19th century. By the time the books came out, they're they're really the beginnings of a psychological astrology. It's it's it is less prediction, um, and I, maybe because she was also getting older, I don't know. But I think that is kind of the way that it was able to be popularized at that time. It, it over the course of her lifetime in terms of what she published and the types of predictions and forecasts that she gave to the newspapers, it changed radically, that it was kind of very doom and gloom in a way, you know, New York was it will eventually crash into the sea, you know, that was in 1899 or 1900, she said that, and then by the 30s, by the time she's doing the books, um, it's much softer. And, I, you know, society had changed a great deal, too, in the, t- in the intervening years. And do you, do you think the movement away from the predictive sign had in part to do with the court cases and away from the fortune-telling things? Or was it more that, that the psychological approach was simply easier to mass market? You know, I think it's both, and I think it's, just a trend that she always really seemed to have her finger on the trends but I think a lot of it did have to do with the court case Um, again it's such an interesting parallel that poor Alan Leo in the UK was convicted of fortune telling and he had to rewrite all his books and he set out to do it and I think he had a stroke and he dropped dead whereas Evangeline got off um, she convin- continued to predict, but she was always when she would do it, which is nice when to go back and see the forecasts, um, she always mentions 
uh, like with the World War II when the stock market crashed, it's the cycle of Uranus, Uranus and Gemini. Or, you know, she mentions it because that's what got her off in court, according to the judge, that because she she wasn't, like, making this made-up pronouncement. It was that it was a very... She referred to a specific astrological thing, and she could show them a book that said that, that this is the nature. So in a sense, she was just reporting on an established science. Um, So she was freer to forecast. She didn't have to, you know, she probably did change her, um, you know, we don't have a lot of examples of her very early reports that she gave, but I imagine it must have undergone some kind of change too because by the time our books come out, it is different. I think it's hard to say exactly what happened, but certainly the reason she was allowed to continue was that she got off. She was not con- convicted. Now, I've heard... Oh, go ahead, Ina. I was just... I was heard in her books that's, that there is some controversy over who wrote what, especially in her earlier material, with because she had been working with Aleister Crowley. That was my question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we both yeah. Well, we want to know. Yes. It's such a fascinating, fascinating story because he, you know, if you know anything about him, he just really was, you know, kind of the sex and drugs and rock and roll guy of his time. And she, on the other hand, um, I recently found out she, uh, uh, as Alan Leo, had a platonic relationship with her husband, that it was supposed to be just a spiritual connection. So these two, like, diametrically opposed people working together is is just fascinating. And um, I think she had, she had a lot of notes from Dr. Smith, she said, and she inherited all of his astrological information. Um, I think my impression is that she was not a writer herself, so that even though she had the information, he was an astrologer, but he was much more of a magician and an occultist. Um, he, My impression now, the gentleman that published Evangeline's books under Aleister Crowley's name will tell you otherwise, but my take on it is that he was lesser an astrologer than he was an occultist. And many, I mean, he was a brilliant man, but um, and he was very much up to the task of helping her write these books. Um, so I think he, she kind of gave him the information and he wrote it. He does say in one of his books that um, he learned a lot, so obviously he got information from her. So I think it was a joint effort, personally. Um, it's hard to say you know, who who does what. Um, you can see from the work that's been published under his name, it is slightly different. He's very acerbic. He's very strong-minded, where she's she's more balanced. You know, he wrote a book on the, the tarot called The Book of Thoth, and Thoth yeah. was the mythology uh, the, in Egypt, the, the scribe, the writer, the creative writer, intelligent person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. And so they were that. they were an odd couple, but <laughs> yeah, they were very. I mean, this is another thing that people like to think that they they were involved and they had an affair, and I really don't. <laughs> really well, don't I, get I meant, but they they did have a like, falling out, didn't they? Yeah, they did because he said she tried to cheat him out of the profits, but I think she hired him just to do the writing, and she didn't want to pay him royalties. That's my take on that, but um, eventually now it's been published under his name. The same works. So anyone, can, you know, it's anyone's opinion, really, what happened. What happened <laughs> so, so back to her astrology. Now, mm-hmm. my sense is that her astrology, I mean, she has access to techniques that we're perhaps not using today. So could you talk a little bit about her astro- how her astrology may be different than the way mm-hmm. today's astrologers might practice astrology? Yeah, I I mean, I think that her techniques are out there, and in the book on her techniques um, that I wrote, What Evangeline Adams Knew, I I try to reconstruct it. So we have some examples from her books, not many, because she wrote more for a popular audience. Um, And we have some examples from, you know, magazine articles and newspapers where she talks about what she did. But she, my impression of it is that she was a traditional astrologer. She really came from a certain tradition, um, in the 19th century, in, in the United States, it seemed they used Ptolemy very much, and 
course, we, you know, I have that book. A lot of us have that book. Um, today, it's much more, I think, the greater proportion of people are more using psychological characteristics, which she would talk about. But it was more predictive in her day. And I think that's why people came to her um, for the predictive side of it, to find out, um, you know, what would happen and is this a good time to do so, you know, like they do today. Um, I mean, that's the type of forecasting that I give to my clients. I know a lot of other people shy away from that, but I think that's what a lot of people are interested in. Um, of course, a lot of people are also just coming and talking about themselves <laughs> as well. But um, it, it was more predictive, basically, and, and um, from a, a number of things. I think she used horary astrology very much. You know, she talks about predicting the death of Enrico Caruso, um, and I think she used horary astrology for that. She had her own little take on horary astrology, which is, um, you know, someone asks a question and you do a, a horoscope for the question. So you're not looking at the birth chart. You're looking at a chart for the question. So I think she used that. Um, I don't know if she used it all the time. She she had a half an hour consultation. So it's a very short time to read a chart like that, but I think she did use it. Um, those are some of the techniques that, that come down also from medical astrology. When you have a chart for the beginning of an illness, it's like a horary type of chart. Now, I was really surprised reading in, um, I mean, I'm just because it's what I had on my shelf, um, the Astrology for Everyone book. She's got a section on the meeting of Uranus and the meeting of Neptune. And, I mean, at this point, I don't think Pluto had been discovered yet or was getting no. very close to be discovered. So, And these are relatively fleshed-out descriptions yeah. of Uranus and Pluto, considering they're not far away from what we're using today. So was she breaking ground on the, her discussion of outer planets, too? I don't think so. And, and you're right, Pluto was, I think, discovered... She died before anything was studied astrologically about Pluto. I think it was the same year, 1932. Yeah. Um, Uranus had been around for 100 years, more than 100 years. So I think her interpretation... Yes, in 1786-ish? 81. Yeah. 81? So okay. she she grew up in all the astrologers that she knew, knew Uranus. But Neptune was a little later, and actually in the trial transcript, she says that when the detective came... Um, the detective had Moon conjunct Neptune, and she said she asked her what that was. Was there some kind of fatality, is the word she is connected with the mother, because she said she was collecting information on Neptune. So I think Neptune wasn't yet so settled. So in terms of her, I think she probably, some of her own research went into her impression and her interpretation of Neptune. Yeah, I mean, I I find the whole talk about that she was using Uranus cycles of 84 years to do predictive work because when you say that, I'm reminded of, you know, Richard Tarnas writing about Cosmos and Psyche or um, the book that Nick Dagan Best just wrote on the history of the U.S. and Uranus cycles. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that, that said that she was doing it almost 100 years ago. Yes, and Doctor, she gets it from Dr. Broughton, and his book, I think, is 1898 or 1899. And I think he came up with it. That's the best that I can judge. And I think Nick Campion, in one of his books or articles, I think he, he judged that, too, that he that he's the first um, writing we have about Uranus cycle, the first identification of the Uranus cycle in the U.S. So... There's nothing new. <laughs> you know, it's been around for, for quite a while. Amazing. So what do you think is Evangeline's greatest legacy for us as astrologers today? Oh, gosh. Um, I think that she made us, she used the term astrology conscious, and she did make us astrology conscious. And Astrology did come to popularity. It, she kind of was riding the crest of a wave. Um, you know, there was a lot of interest in different occult studies, particularly in the teens and 20s. And, um, you know, like it, it came back around the 70s also. But she kind of rode the crest of that wave. And people knew more about it. She 
did start to do certain astrology columns. She was not the first. I think the first was in the UK in 1930. And the ones I have found from her are like 1931. And it's not like we have today. It's it's different. But it was predictive. And it did. Um, she addressed one sign. She did decanets. So that, too, I think... Um, getting it into the newspapers, um, getting it into people's consciousness so that before she came along, you couldn't go into a bookstore and buy easily buy a book and learn about astrology. So I, I think that um, partly through her efforts, um, that really changed, and it's remained that way since her day. I love her tenacity to keep pushing astrology consciousness. She gets arrested. She uses it for publicity. She mar- even marries a much younger man when it was taboo. And just very confident woman for her age, the age really that she was. lived in. She knew who she was. This astrology mm-hmm. had kind of, um, it showed her who she was. And it was something that she just really related to and um let her be on her own and, you know, self-supporting in a time when most women weren't and, you know, very successful. And mm-hmm. she loved it. <laughs> it was her thing. <laughs> and um, she stuck with it. She had a lot of fixed signs in her chart, and uh, it just really worked out for her. Now, I think she's inspirational if you're not an astrologer. I mean, yes. really to go and and... To buck the system that way Mm -hmm. with your, you know, go against your family and even the expectations of the times to follow what you believe in is pretty amazing, especially for a woman because it was doubly hard at the time. Yeah. We had far less freedoms than we have today. Yeah. And and a a number of women in those years in the late 19th century did get involved in spiritualism and different types of the occult because it was open to them. A lot of education was closed to them, or it was hard to get into it. It was hard to get get a particular job where you had authority. And in these fields, you could create it for yourself, but you had to be independent. And she was very comfortable in that role. Did she ever have to come up against religious groups that thought that maybe astrology wasn't in tune with being, you know, yeah, her contract with the radio station was not renewed, and mm-hmm. um, I've kind of pieced it together. Um, I don't have anything, once again, completely definitive, but it seems clear because at that time there were a number of other different occult shows on the radio as well, and they were all canceled, and you know, there was a policy change that I have documented that it's not in the public's best interest. And there was this real consciousness at that time that you're coming into people's living rooms. It was the first time that anything like this had happened. And by the time she was doing it, it was sponsored by advertisers, and they were very cautious. And she had a very popular show, but it didn't continue. And I think probably one of the reasons is that some religious groups or conservative groups or groups that did not like astrology wrote into the advertisers, you know, inundated them and said, look, this is terrible, or, you know, write to the congressman or whatever, you know, they they changed it. And um, that, I think she could have been even more popular had she continued on the radio. Isn't it that always the way with the media, that when the advertisers get involved, everything gets more conservative? (laughs) (laughs) So, since we only have a few minutes left, uh, let's talk a little bit about how Evangeline died. She had had a number of health problems. I have some letters of hers from her late years, and, and she had a number of... She didn't watch her diet. I don't know if anyone did in those days. You know, they used lard. There were, <laughs> the, the foods were not as healthful, I don't think, as what you can get today. So she had a number of health problems, and she had a stroke. And um, I think within a couple of days after that, she died. And the husband, of course, went to all the papers and said that she predicted her own death. But (laughs) I I, I think maybe after the initial stroke she did, but I don't know if she needed her horoscope to do that at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, Karen, it has been a pleasure talking to you tonight. How can our listeners find you? Um, Oh, 
through the Internet, and um, I'm in New York, and um, you can reach me. Just do a search for Karen Cristino. You can buy my books online at any number of different places. Well, I highly recommend that you track down her books because uh, Evangeline's story is amazing and Karen is an excellent writer. So, without further ado, my name is Donna Woodwell and you can also find me at the Dead Astrologer Society on Facebook or on Twitter at just plain old Dead Astrologers. Uh, uh, Enid is here with us. She is the president of Kepler College. You can look up Kepler College at Kepler edu which i also highly recommend as a great place for classes and more information and susan how can we find you um www.susanhanson.com awesome so thank you very much tonight i'm only talking very fast because once again we have almost over talked our hours so i hope you will come back next week as we celebrate the solstice together this has been a fabulous show thank you for coming all of our guests thank you thank you And you are welcome back anytime at the Dead Astrologer Society.